Hi everyone. Uh, no, your eyes are not fooling you. Kenny's hair did not grow back super fast. Uh, I'm not Kenny Roy. My name is Tim Sorman, and uh, I've been an animator for about eight years. Uh, I started out in film and television, and, uh, and then I moved on to games, which is what I've been doing for the last five years or so. Um, I work on VeggieTales, uh, some DVDs, and the, uh, the Pirates Who Don't Do Anything VeggieTales movie, which was in theaters. Then I worked on Alvin and the Chipmunks, the first one, at Rhythm and Hughes. Uh, then I worked on, I moved into games, and I worked on a game called Dark Void. Uh, and most recently the game I shipped was Star Trek, the video game, uh, done up here in Canada at Digital Extremes. Uh, after that shipped, I worked on some prototype stuff for a while, um, and now I'm actually working from home as a freelance animator, which is very cool and exciting. I've known Kenny for about 10 years or so, uh, although I've never met him. Uh, I'm sure you've heard him mention once or twice that uh, you know he learned a lot in, in the early days. He learned a lot online from visiting forums and getting feedback from strangers and just and meeting professionals there. Uh, and that was kind of how I met Kenny. When I was a student, um, I think it was my last year, university, uh, he was a moderator or an administrator on a website called digitalrendering.com, which is gone now. But uh, they actually ran a contest that was, it worked like this. You would say, I would like to enter the contest for this month. But instead of having a month to animate, you would then get an email that said, okay, here's the topic of your animation contest. Submit your video four hours from now. So four hours from the timestamp of your email, which was cool. So the contest ran all month, but each contestant only had four hours to crank something out really quick. So Kenny has done this, uh, this, this anim gym idea is not completely brand new to him, but uh, I think it's a little bit more reasonable this time where you can spend more than four hours. Um, that said, if you can do a quick test in four hours or less, uh, do it and then do an extra one. Uh, the more practice, the better. Okay, uh, so welcome to this special guest guest lecture on KennyRoy.com. Uh, today's topic is called Kenny is Wrong. <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually part one of a series of Kenny is Wrong lectures that I would like to do. Uh, <clears throat> Kenny, Kenny emailed me and said, you know, hey, if you ever want to do a guest lecture, let me know uh, what your ideas are and we'll see. And so one of my ideas was, you know, I've watched a lot of your lectures and your Ask Video Mails, and from time to time, um, you know, you, you may say something that I, I respond by going, you know, I do it a little different from that. Um, the truth is, you know, I'm not really saying Kenny is wrong and I'm right, uh, obviously. I think, uh, you know, his, his pedigree is kind of speaks for itself. He knows what he's doing and he knows what he's talking about. Um, but I would say, and I think Kenny would agree, that it's always good to be experimenting with your workflow. Uh, trying new things and a lot of the time there will be little pieces of a workflow that you hadn't thought of before so someone else might suggest and after trying it you might find it very useful now if you try some of these things I talk about today and you find that they're not useful at all um, or they slow you down that's fine don't waste your time on it I'm wrong you can you can make a guest lecture series about how Tim Sorman is wrong that's perfectly fine um, but if you do find it useful, then that's great, and I've, I've done my part. So today's Kenny is Wrong guest lecture is about using Maya's breakdown keys and using lattices in the graph editor. Now, technically, uh, these are things that, that Kenny has not said are wrong to do. He doesn't say do not use breakdowns or do not use lattices in the graph editor, but he has kind of said you know, I don't really get the point of these things, I, I just don't use them. Um, but I've, I've found them quite useful, so I would like to show you a little bit about how, uh, how useful they can be. So let's jump on into Maya here, 
and uh, I will start showing you what I'm talking about. Okay. Okay, here we are in Maya. This is my entry in November's Anim Gym exercise. It is a girl skipping rope. And it was a lot of fun to work on. Um, it's been a while since I've done a personal exercise, so this was fantastic. Um, it is still a work in progress. Please don't hold this against me. It's a little rough. And uh, it also doesn't play at full speed when I'm capturing my screen, so never fear. A quick time here to... Let's hide those scary eyes. Quick time here to demonstrate a little bit better. There we go. So um, that skipping rope, by the way, this is really cool. That, that's the, uh, the grease pencil in Maya 2014. Um, you can basically draw frame by frame, just like traditional animation. And it's, it's in your Maya scene. You can, you can drag the frames around on the timeline to retime them. Uh, it's pretty awesome. I wish it was a little bit awesomer, and I assume it will probably improve in future versions. They, there's no feature to, um, you can copy and paste keys, but you can't like grab the drawing and scale it or move it around. Um, so you, you kind of have to redraw unless you want just that exact drawing. So when, when I'm cycling through here, like if the hand is in a slightly different spot, I've got to draw a custom drawing for that just to, to match up to her hand, even though I could probably use and scale a previous drawing. Um, but anyways, that's, that's not really important. That was, that was more just me exploring a new feature. Um, if I was smart, and if you're smart too, <laughs> I highly recommend not drawing on top of your 3D animation, at least not every frame like this, until uh, the 3D stuff is locked down. When, it, when it's final and done, uh, anything that has to match to it, you'll, you'll just want to do it once. You don't want to have to be redrawing it over and over again. Uh, you could maybe rough stuff in, but... Um, I wouldn't animate it over and over again. So yeah, this is a great uh, this is a great example for talking about Maya breakdown keys because I got some good feedback in the forums already. Um, one point that somebody made was that it might be just a little too fast uh, the whole scene overall. Uh, certainly, the frame range is not big enough for the Anim Gym. It's supposed to be 48 to 72 frames. Uh, I was thinking I would just double this 24 frame cycle and maybe add a bit of variety to it. But, you know, someone said, I think it's moving too fast. Maybe you should stretch it out as well. So I'm going to try stretching it out to 36 frames per, uh, per cycle. And uh, I could double that up to 72 to add some variety um, and to make sure that I get within the proper threshold to get above 48 frames. So... Let's see, how, how do we retime an entire scene? I'm sure you guys have done this 100 times before, and you probably have a few different ways. Um, you can select all the controls. You can certainly use the, uh, the dope sheet. Um, let's see, uh, window animation editor, dope sheet. Take all of these. Let's see, dope sheet summary. Oh, sorry, that's outside the capture window, isn't it? Um, and let's zoom in here a bit. I really don't use the dope sheet that much, uh, but I should. I should use it more because it's very cool. Um, can you scale in here? Yeah, you've got these handles, right? You just click and drag. Beautiful, right? Um, but I can't see what, what number I'm on. What frame number is that? How much am I scaling it? Ooh, sorry, that is not the best option. Maybe someone who's uh, more of an expert in the dope sheet would know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. Um, I want 36 frames, so I set it to 36. Uh, how about I grab all these, and I just middle mouse drag to scale. Ah, oh, shoot. I can't, right? So annoying. I'm, I'm sure nobody does this, because they, they probably tried it the very first time and re run, ran into this problem, and it's so annoying. Um, you know, you try to set this to 37 and do it, Right, and then you're not exactly on there, and you have to snap your keys, and then what is that mess, right? Not good. We don't want to do that. 
you could um, use a mail script, um, which is actually something I do pretty often. I've got a great one from Louis Libera, I think. I don't know how you pronounce his name. LL scale key. Um, and that just allows you to, uh, to take all of your keys. Do I have to have it selected in the graph editor or here? Well, I do both. Um, and you just set the time to be like 150%. Uh, zero will be the anchor point that it scales from. Um, but my animation starts on frame one, so I'm going to set it to minimum, which is just the, the lowest time value or the lowest value value if you're scaling values. Uh, and hit go. Bam. Oh, sorry. You know what? I do need to scale from... <laughs> Bam! Eat that. I did it wrong. Uh, I think I do need to scale from zero. Yeah. Funny. Okay. So anyways, I'm going to eat my words here. But yeah, that scales from zero. I think that's right to 36. Um, no, you know what? That's messy. You know what? It works a lot better if that animation was actually from zero to 25. But perfect. I mean, that, that's a great example. Don't use mail scripts because... Um, they're doing stuff under the hood and you don't always get 100% control. I thought I was going to get 150% of a 24 frame cycle up to 36, right? But I've got a 25 frame cycle because the first and last frame are the exact same, right? Uh, so well, I can't guess at the percentage. What's that? 150.1%. That's not going to work. So, um, breakdown keys to the rescue, um, I totally embarrassed myself, and now I'm going to totally redeem myself by showing you the right way to do it. You uh, you want to retime your entire scene. So how do we do that? We want to, the easiest thing, you know, think about it, the workflow you want. You want to just grab this last key, put it where you want it, and you want everything in between to just proportionally scale, right? You can't, I mean, you can't scale in the graph editor. It's monstrous, right? Um... I have no control over uh, the anchor point. It's very hard to be exactly precise, right? Wherever you, wherever your mouse is when you click that middle mouse button and start dragging is where it anchors. Um, and you have no control over, you know, if I wanted to scale this to an exact frame, oh man, that would be so hard. I'd have to zoom just the right amount and drag it over. And where's 35? There's 30. Oh, oh almost there, 34. Is that 35? No, there. Oh, there. Ugh, brutal, right? And I still didn't... Um, oh, I wanted 36, of course. Um, but yeah, you know, it's just really hard to, to make these tiny little precise movements with your mouse. Not the way to do it. Um, my breakdown keys are made for this. Select all of your animation keys in the timeline. Right-click, keys, convert to breakdown. And you'll notice that they've all turned green. Um, a real key is red, and a breakdown key is green. Real keys, um, I call them, uh, well, I mean, you just call them keys, but after you might convert them into breakdowns, what we need to do is define our anchor points. So the first is going to be an anchor. I'm going to just hit S again. That should set it back to being a real key, okay? And it also ensures that I get a key on every, every control, because uh, if I wanted an anchor on, say, frame 10, you can see easily here in the graph editor, not every control has a key on frame 10, even though in the timeline I just see a tick. Um, so even if I had, you know, even if that was closed, I'm just going to hit S so I know. I don't, I don't need to check visually whether uh, frame 25 is keyed on all channels because I knew, I know I selected the entire character and I hit S. Okay. Now to read time, simply take that last key and drag it up to 36 where you want it. And uh, let's see, this should actually be 36, and this should be 35, I believe, right? Just so that um, when I'm looping it, I don't play that frame twice. Now you'll see the first downfall of, uh, of scaling your animation um, by any means, including breakdown keys, is that you will often, or you will almost always, wind up with keys that fall in between frames. These are called non-integer frames. Okay, uh, They won't show up 
like when you render frame um, 18 here, you're not getting your key exactly. You're getting something close to your key, but you're getting a Maya interpolated um, pose right next to your key that's not quite perfect. Um, and we pretty much never want that. Um, it's not so bad right now because I stretched out the animation as opposed to compressing it. I can take all of these and I can snap them and it will uh, offset the timing a bit. But I, I'm not expecting this to be like a, a one step fix, right? Like I'm going to have to do my, my gross retiming to the whole thing. Uh, then I'm going to have to go back in here and do my more granular retiming. Now, um, let me back up a step here. Sorry. I don't actually, whoa, I don't want to st um, snap those just yet. There we go. Okay. What I actually want to do is before I switch back to real keys, I'm going to do my, my granular editing while these are still maintaining their correct proportion. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, I'm probably going to want my graph editor back for this. I don't need to see the keys. I just need to see, um, you know, kind of in columns. I need to select my keys. This is a perfect example of, of something I could do in the dope sheet. Um, but I'm a graph editor guy. I apologize. I don't mind drag clicking a box. Uh, so what I want to do is I want to take my poses. If I use the, um, the greater than less than keys on my keyboard, or I guess it's comma and period, because uh, I'm not holding a modifier. I can step through my non-integer frames, no problem, okay? Uh, on the timeline, I can only select whole frames, but with the hotkey, I can snap properly. So let's find, now I've, I've stretched the whole thing out. Let's look at it first before I go around messing with, with uh, more granular edits. Let's look at the whole thing, okay? It does feel it is certainly slower. Let me, um, you know what? I don't need this anymore. This is killing me to, to delete it all, but it shouldn't because you know what? You've gotta be, you gotta be brutal when you're making edits. Delete stuff that doesn't need to be there and uh, you'll do it better when you, when you make it again. So that stuff's gone, so it's not distracting us. Okay, let's check this out now. It's going a little slower. Uh, sorry again, it's not playing every frame. It's not playing smoothly while I capture. Uh, but I think you can get the gist of it, and I think it feels actually a little too slow, but that's okay, because now I've got a little bit more time uh, in total, and I can work on my, my phrasing a bit. Um, the parts of the animation that, uh, that I want to emphasize. So one of the, the other things somebody pointed out is uh, to emphasize some of the down and up motion. Um, I think it could be a lot more snappy and interesting. So let's see here. Uh, I think we can do that with timing first, and we may do a bit of value later, um, but we're talking about breakdown, so let's get into to timing. So I'm going to find my anchor poses, my important poses that I want to keep on whole frames. I don't want them to be in between. Um, and I'm emphasizing my ups and downs. So where's my down pose extreme right here? Let's find, um, I'm actually going to find the part where I leave the ground. Is that here? I think so. The foot's just leaving. And then uh, it touches down again on one of these. How about this one? Okay. And I need to find my middle of my cycle. Make sure I key that so it doesn't change. Fine. Oh, sorry. My down pose is right here. And I'm using, uh, I'm using those keyboard hotkeys again to make sure I, I'm not going to whole frames. I'm going to my actual keys. Leave the ground here. Contact the ground here. OK. Um, now, this is where the graph editor comes in. I'm going to select just my real keys, my actual key poses. Those are adjacent, so I can drag them in one box. There we go. Okay. And I'm going to, is it edit? Keys. 
snap no where is it snap yeah it was an edit sorry <laughs> snap so now I'm snapping just these to whole frames okay um, it distorts things maybe a little bit but certainly less than it did before when I snapped everything right and now I'm going to be able to grab these on the timeline just the red ones the green ones if I try to grab them on the timeline see I'm not grabbing precisely on the key but with the red ones I am okay that's why I be snapped so I want to make this a little bit snappier have a little more pep and life to it so I'm gonna take the her down frame I'm just gonna make her hold it a bit more okay and I know this between 8 and 14 is when she's up in the air I want to stretch that out a bit so let's take uh, 8 and move it back a little bit and 14 move it forward a little bit and I'll do the same for the second half of the cycle and I'm not going to snap everything in between at least not yet let's just look at this now that certainly has more pep to it um, let me see if I can uh, <laughs> My autosave is on. Let me turn that off so it doesn't keep popping up every time. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. And autosave is a, is a lifesaver, but uh, you don't want it when you're doing video lectures, I guess. Okay. Uh, what was I doing? I was going to play blast this for you because it's so bad at uh, playing full speed here. I don't want to save it. Let's just make it small. Bring it into the capture window, loop it, and play. Okay, uh, certainly snappier. I think you know there's some weight issues uh, because she she goes up and she kind of hits a height and stays there, but uh, we can fix that in a minute. Does that feel snappier? I think so. Feels pretty good. Um, okay, um, I'm just gonna edit this piece in here. I want to show you that uh, you can you can address that issue using the lattice tool it doesn't quite work perfectly in this case but um, in some cases it will uh, so let's just see if we can fix that part where it looks like she kind of hits a ceiling and stops we just want to adjust the the height of her jump uh, let's select all of her ik controls there we go and i think these come with it just check yeah those are all the ones that move and we'll go to this is our, our jump here where she kind of hits the ceiling we want to to give her a little bit more height in the middle let's open up the graph editor here now this is so this is kind of like a little preview of, of the lattices that are coming up in the second half um, you can edit this height by selecting this range opening up the lattice deform tool and I've got it set to three columns right now that puts one right in the middle here that I can grab and lift um, some things aren't moving that's because some things don't have any keys between here and here so I'm just going to with with translate Y selected I'm going to hold I uh, and see how I got that crosshairs that is a, a shortcut key for inserting keys which is the same as push, pressing this button so I hold I and then middle mouse click and that sets a key in the middle. So now um, I can select that range, last form tool, and I can shift that up. Now see how everything is getting higher except for her right arm, the screen left arm. Uh, unfortunately, because the way Morphe is rigged, that ac that hands world axis or local axis, sorry, is is not exactly the same as all the others, uh, which is good because it mirrors a lot of things but in this particular case um, you know I, I wish they both translated up anyways uh, it, it's still easy to do I can I can add the height here and um, my auto smooth and then pick this one and I know that this is like opposite of normal instead of up being up the uh, down in the graph editor editor means up in world space so I'm just gonna I'm just going to eyeball this. I know that this should be my peak. So I'm just going to put it a little bit higher than this one. 
lower in the graph editor, higher in world space, and run my auto smooth again. Okay, so I can edit the height that way. So I can, I mean, I can ex exaggerate this to the extreme if I want to. Um, you know, I could go even farther this way. Stay up in the air, come down. Um, even exaggerate the down. You know, the longer you stay up, the, the bigger your anticipation needs to be. And you know, I'm, this is probably a good uh, a good form of variety to add in there. I probably won't make every hop the same height. So I like that. Um, I'm going to keep working on this. Hopefully I can make it look a lot better. I'm going to go check out the rest of the feedback as well. All right. So I think uh, I think you get the point of how breakdown keys work in Maya. Um, just a quick recap of the pros and cons. Uh, they are very easy to use and tweak until they're right um, because it's in your timeline. You just scrub it, um, move it around. You don't need a second window open uh, like you do with the dope sheet or the graph editor. Um, it doesn't require any scripts, although you can use scripts. Um, I, I guess I never mentioned, I do have a script that helps me, it, it deletes all of the non-integer frames. So for example, sorry, let me go back in here. Um, I've stretched this time. Um, I could snap these breakdowns, but let's say I don't want to, I just, I want to set new keys, right? But I don't want to have all these non-integer frames hanging out. I'll select them all, run my um, the script, it's JP keyframe tools. Uh, I think possibly if I select a frame range in here, yes, it will delete just the selected ones. So yeah, you can do um, just a part of it if you want, and you can leave the rest on non-integer frames if you want. I don't generally like leaving them on non-integer frames. It's so messy. Um, it's just, I've got a little bit of... Uh, neurosis about that I guess um, but I suppose if you're you know if you're done with the shot and you don't anticipate having to clean it up again and it looks good in the viewport you know who cares if you're if your key ticks are, are on a whole frame or not but you know if you're handing it off and you think you know if there's any chance another animator might have to pick up your shot you don't want them opening your shot and going what is this mess so clean those up um, either snap them to whole frames or set new keys on whole frames and then go back through and make sure that um, they look good and they, they don't look like dumb Maya in-betweens anymore. Okay, um, so they're, they're easy to tweak until they're right. Um, another pro is that compared to Maya's scene time warp, um, this is a much, much better option. Um, if you're familiar with Maya's time warp, it's kind of like an After Effects time remapping um, and if you don't have an experience with that I guess it's basically if you looked in the graph editor you would see one line that goes diagonally bottom left up here like this and this represents the entire scene um, you could think of it even as the playback rate for the entire scene and you can set key ticks along there and instead of playing linear you can slow down some parts and speed up other parts just like you would slow down or speed up um, one axis in the graph editor, you're doing this to the entire scene. The problem with that is that you can't bake it back down onto the controls, right? It's always going to be a separate edit on top of your controls. Um, and that's never good because it's often, you know, if, if you get a scene like that that somebody else worked on maybe, and they did a scene time wrap, time warp on it, you're going to look at it and you go, why is this moving so fast in this section? I can't even tell. Um, oh, the edit is in another place, not visible to me. It's not in the timeline. The, the keys are all in the same frames. Why is the scene changing the playback rate? Uh, so that's just, it's just messy. Um, if you could bake that back down to controls, I suppose it wouldn't be too bad, but I think it affects the entire scene. Uh, so it would include your cameras and other characters, and if you're just trying to retime one character or one part of one character, uh, that's not the option you want, okay? So it's better than the scene time warp. Um, there is, in 2013 and plus, 2013, 2014, 
Maya has a tool in the graph editor called the read timing tool, which works very much like the um, breakdown keys. But let me just show you um, one downfall of it. I'm going to go back into Maya. And if I want to do a, um, what's it called? Sorry, the, uh, the read timing tool. It is an edit transformation tools, read time tool. Okay, I can create anchors. This is very much like when I was setting real keys after making breakdown keys. Okay, and let's put one, um, one here and one here. Okay, this one's going to illustrate my point. So when you're working with breakdowns, you have to make a conscious deci decision about what your anchor poses are going to be, which frames you want to uh, maintain perfectly without Maya interpolating it at all. And those are the ones that you're going to drag around in the timeline and everything else Maya is going to intelligently or hopefully um, interpolate for you. Okay. With the retime tool, as long as you set your handles on a frame that has everything keyed, it works fine just as predicted, okay? It stretches. Even, um, it's a little bit different. You'll notice even real keys, the uh, the black ticks here in the graph editor, I'm pointing at my screen, I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> um, but the black ticks, they're sliding around just like breakdown keys would be, right? So you don't have to go converting things back and forth between real keys and breakdown keys, okay? Um, that could be a pro or a con of the system. Uh, I think it's a con because I like to know in the graph editor which are which. Whereas if, if all of these were regular keys, um, you know, I can be happily editing away in the graph editor, but in the timeline, I have no idea what, what's what. And if I want to move something from frame 12 to frame 10, I've got to use these little numbers down here. Okay. Um, but what's really bad about this is it doesn't force you to key everything on the frame that you set a, an edit point, a handle to drag. So if I drag this handle, let me zoom in a little bit. Okay. To make my point. Okay, see this uh, this red axis right here? Just look at where it is um, relative to the graph, um, the grid in the background. You can see it's this high, right? That's the value on this frame. Um, that's the value of that red channel on my handle, which is my anchor, right? That's is the pose I don't want to change. But look what happens when I drag it and retime. Okay, because it's not keyed on that frame, it's slid way up here. You can't even hear it because it's uh, you can't even see it because it's behind my, my picker window, okay? So that's not good. We don't want that. Um, so this tool can be good, um, but I like breakdowns better, all right? That was the whole point of that nonsense. Okay, get back out of there. Um, now the downsides to using breakdown keys is obviously I've mentioned non-integer frames a lot. I think you get the point there. Um, you have to select all of the controls first, which, you know, I find it quite easy to just uh, have a button. I, I have one anyways for, for blocking in my animation. Uh, that's just a select all button for the entire rig. But, you know, maybe maybe you find that extra click too troublesome. Um, if you're a dope, dope sheet guy, you can use the scene summary and it automatically has everything in there. You don't have to select it first. Um, you can do your retiming in there. So, you know, that, that could be a downfall of, of the breakdown key method. The other one, I'm going to need to switch over here now um, away from my animation just to this little block. Okay, I want to illustrate another point. These edits made with breakdown keys, I've got this set up already. Um, this is just... Uh, the cube animation, sorry, it, it's really not important what it's doing. I just want you to look at these curves in the graph editor. And I need to get out of, there we go. I was still on the, uh, that other tool. Okay, now let's say I wanted to retime this. I've got three different types of animation here, okay? This one would be like, say, a, a blocking pass on an animation. It's very clean. Um, this represents an entire animation, okay? Not just one curve. It's very clean. Everything is keyed on the same frames. And it's just all of my key poses and uh, key breakdown poses, okay? 
Um, that's what these represent. This green one represents an animation that is still pretty much in blocking, but maybe the animator wasn't entirely disciplined um, like this guy. And, uh, and there are a few stray keys in here that are not key poses. Um, they're, maybe he offset something um, to get some overlap, or, or he's got just a, a few in-betweens on um, just parts of a character, not, not the entire character, right? That's what these green ticks represent. And this last one here is a fella who's got mocap. Okay, so he's got keys on every frame. And let's say everybody wants to retime their little animation the same way. Okay, we want to take that and just exaggerate the plateau. Sorry. Okay, now what you'll see here, and okay, these are a little messy. Um, but let's say you use Maya's uh, auto tangent to smooth it out. Okay, that's pretty handy. Look at that. Look how hard of an angle you get there. That is one of the major downfalls of the breakdown retiming process, is that it doesn't hide the edit very well. Okay, you get these hard changes in direction. Um, I use a different auto tangent tool, which is, it kind of favors an even smoother look, but even that, um, can't do it right, and I start getting this overshoot, which is not nice. Uh, in blocking, it works pretty well, okay? Um, no big deal. As soon as you add an adjacent key, though, and you start sliding things around, you start getting these hard corners. And if it's mocap, there's nothing you can do to get rid of that hard corner. Um, it, I mean, there is. I'll, I'll show you what to do, but it's going to emphasize it even worse, okay? This actually segues very nicely into our next topic, which is, you know, let's say I'm not in the blocking anymore. Let's say I've got a finished shot or a nearly finished shot and someone gives me a note to adjust the timing. Or let's say I've got a mocap shot that is full of dense data and someone gives me a note to adjust, um, you know, the hang time here. How do I do that? I would love to use my breakdown thing because it's so easy, but I need a different tool. What else do I do? Um, I've got the answer for you coming up next. Okay, welcome back. Uh, we're talking about lattices now. Um, when we left off, we were talking about how breakdowns can cause a, a rather abrupt change in direction when you enter your edit region and exit your edit region. Um, and we wanted to know how to solve that. Well, with the Lattice Deformer, you can select a, uh, a range from a peak to a valley. Whatever is on the extreme of your selection, the first key and the last key will remain anchored, and everything in between is what we're going to shift around and squeeze, okay? So you can edit all of these together. Because we're editing time, you can edit all three channels at once, okay, um, or your entire character at once. Um, yeah, between between extreme poses. This doesn't necessarily have to be from a peak to a valley. It can just be from pose to pose, okay? So you're squeezing these just like we did before with the breakdown keys, only this time. Notice how... Let's see, I can squeeze this maybe even more. No, I'm just going to leave it at that. Okay. Um, deselect. You'll see now how everything has stayed relatively smooth. Let me just, uh, I don't know, auto tangent there. Okay. There's a nice smooth transition here. We kind of expected that. Pretty smooth here, although there's a bit of a corner there. That's actually Maya's auto tangent. For some reason, it favors linear as opposed to actually smooth. Uh, so I'm going to run my other auto tangent mouse script. Um, there's one uh, by, oh, who did that? Auto smooth. I think it was Michael Comet has an auto smooth tangent that you can find um, that allows you to tweak just how how much it favors being flat or curvy. Okay. And this guy down here looks pretty good too. Okay. 
this is probably the best the best one to look at. Okay, when we compare that to just using the breakdown keys. Okay, if I just take the breakdown key and I nudge it. Even with my extra smooth auto tangent thing, you, you are still going to see a hard corner there. Okay? Um, Maya's auto smooth actually does a little bit better in this case, but it's still a pretty sharp corner. Whereas if I use a lattice deformer, you know, I think I've got more than I need there. See how smooth it's staying? I can push it really far. I think that's at least as far as I moved it with the, uh, with the breakdown keys alone. And you still have a nice smooth transition in and out. Okay? So it's very valuable for that. Um, that's what I would use the lattice deform tool for in the graph editor. <clears throat> Excuse me. The other thing you can use it for, it's very good for uh, mocap data. As you'll see, I've, I've taken this blue channel and I've dirtied it up a bit. I've, I've made it a bit wiggly. Um, and let's just say you got your mocap back and it was wiggling like that and you wanted to, to keep the same overall shape, but with less wiggle, okay? Same great shape, less wiggle. You can use a lattice deformer for that. Simply grab the points and squeeze the entire F curve into a little tube. Okay, you can kind of draw a tube with your, with your points here and squeeze the lattice into it. And notice I've got buffer curves turned on so that I can see what it used to be because I still want the average to follow that curve, right? Otherwise I'm changing the animation to uh, in like a fundamental way. I don't want to actually change the motion. I just want the same motion, but cleaner. Squeeze. Okay. So it looks like it's, it's following the same overall trend quite well. Might you know, pull this down just a little. Okay following the same overall trend, but it's a lot smoother now. There's still a little bit of that wiggle there, which is probably a good thing because uh, mocap isn't mocap if it's too perfect. Okay, and I may be, want that a little smoother, piece of cake, okay? Alternatively, uh, let's say, actually here, I'll just delete these. Let's say my mocap came in like this, and here, mocap, there we go, all, all keyed. <clears throat> Let's say my mocap came in like this, and I actually wanted to exaggerate the mocap a little bit, okay? I want to change it in this case. I don't want it to look just like the original mocap. I want to add a little bit more snappiness to it. Depends on the project you're working on. Sometimes they want the mocap to, to look very realistic, don't edit it if you can help it. Uh, and other times they're like, take the mocap and you know push it, make it look more cartoony. Um, we just wanted to make sure we got like a baseline realistic and then you can kind of exaggerate it from there. So, okay, we've got this motion here. I want this sort of S shape again, but now I've got to create it. And I don't want to grab every single point here and do this, I could, but man, that would be tedious. I can reduce the number of points I have to move by using a lattice and just squeezing it again. But this time I'm squeezing it and reshaping it into a new shape. Now I'm, I'm cheating because I'm using, oops, I keep deselecting it, sorry. I'm cheating because I'm using that uh, reference of the, uh, the buffer curve. But I mean, I could just be Arbitrarily, arbitrarily drawing however steep of an S curve I want. Okay, there we go. 
right? It doesn't have the jitter in it because there wasn't any to begin with. Um, but you certainly could. Okay, let's go back. Perfectly linear. Let's take some of these keys. I need to transform to me, translate to me. Let's make it a little bit jittery. Okay. And we want to get that S curve in there. It's going to reduce some of the jitter, but it won't eradicate it entirely. So you'll still have a bit of that jittery feel. Um, I mean, in the mocap, it shouldn't feel jittery, right? If it's if it's there, it's probably counter animation. Um, you know, two joints jittering in sync with each other will, will kind of look pretty steady. Uh, they cancel each other out a little bit. So yeah, so there we go. See, there's the imperfect shape, but it's definitely got a lot more of an ease out and a lot more of an ease in into the valley. Now, the trick here is, oh, and I should point out, um, it doesn't really matter whether you use columns. See here, I've got five columns and two rows. Or if you do the exact opposite, um, kind of an interesting point. You could reshape this by grabbing these points, right, and moving it like that, and this point, and moving it like that. Um, or even just this whole bar, I guess. You could take that and move it down. This whole bar, move it up, OK? You could do that. Uh, the only thing you don't want to do is have lots of both columns and rows, because now you've got so many points to move, you might as well just be grabbing every key on that curve and reshaping it manually. OK? So pick one, whichever one feels right to you. Um, go ahead. OK, actually, I'm going to backpedal a little bit and elaborate on that some more. Um, in that particular instance where I was editing sort of an S-shaped curve on a single F curve, uh, in that case, it didn't really matter whether I used columns or rows. It's more um, you know, what I felt comfortable manipulating to get the shape I wanted. However, uh, it definitely does matter whether you use columns or rows uh, depending on the situation, okay? So let's uh, let's look at that a little bit more detailed this time. Uh, okay, so this red curve here, if, if I want to edit this range, and I know that it starts and ends at the same value, rows are perfectly fine. Uh, in fact, rows are probably the best, right? Because I can very easily and nicely get that plateau shape at the top. If I instead did columns, I can sort of do that too, but you see this is getting a much sharper angle, whereas when I did rows, this this ease out was a was maintained a little bit better. Okay, um, so I mean, just look at the shape that you're drawing. Um, when you have columns, it looks more angular, right? I've got this hard angle right here. And, and that's the result that I'm actually shaping my curve into. If I wanted to, I think I could fix it probably by taking these, moving it down. No, no, can't do that. Um, perhaps if I had more columns. And then I took these outside shapes and moved them down. No. So you definitely want rows when you're editing the, um, the value of a single curve in which the first and last key are of the same value, OK? However, when you get into a situa situation like this where it doesn't loop, uh, the first and last key are not the same value vertically, and you want to use rows to edit it like you did before because it works so nicely, uh, you run into problems, OK? Because this guy is not anchored. Only things at the very bottom or very top are anchored when you're moving vertically. And when you're moving in time, um, the the first, the, the leftmost and rightmost keys are the ones that are anchored. Okay, so if I'm editing time, I definitely want columns, and if I'm editing value, I usually want rows unless I don't. <laughs> okay, unless uh, I can't keep the the first and last key anchored, then you know 
in this case for this green curve, even though I want to edit value, I can't do it with rows, right? Because it will move my, my first key here. I have to do it with columns. So I'm, it's going to take a little bit more work to shape what I want. Um, actually, it's, it's the same amount of work. I just need to know that I need to set five here because I think if I only set three and I move this, um, yeah, you, you get this sharp angle coming out, right? But if I have five and then I do this, these two um, lattice points here are kind of helping to maintain this nice curve. Okay. The other thing to keep in mind is if you're editing more than one channel at the same time, you are definitely going to have to use columns. Okay, because if you use rows, it's, it's the same issue as having um, a single F curve where the first and last key are not, val uh, are not the same value. Here, now, um, you know, it's everything within this box is, is counted. So this is the minimum value here, but then on the left side, neither of these are minimum values or maximum value. So they're not going to be anchored when I try to, to edit value. Okay, So I have to use columns instead of rows in this case as well. Um, I might want, yeah, see, it, it gets a little tricky here because I'm going to edit my maximum. Um, just like I did earlier in the, in the first half of this lecture when I made the girl jump higher, that's OK. That's, this is sort of what that is for. But if you wanted to just add a plateau, um, it, it's a little tricky. Um, you might have to do something like that. And then, yeah, you know, it, it, it's just a little tricky. Perhaps if you add some rows to sort of anchor in between, this might be a case. I'm going to go against what I said before. This might be a case for having a dense grid because you can pick just these points and move them a little bit. Kind of counter animate the middle and just these points a little bit. Um, I don't need to counter animate up here because it's it's at the maximum. It's already anchored. Take both of these down. And push these guys up. Right. So I, I can make it happen. Um, it takes a bit of work, but um, it's a little bit easier than than editing every single one of these keys manually. Okay, so uh, I take back what I said. It does matter if you use rows or columns. Um, if, if you're like, well, I don't want to use either, uh, you could actually just kind of take this range. You can, um, for example, when you're editing just one curve, deselect that. Go back to this case where you're editing just one curve, and you just want to um, change the max height, like I did for that girl's jump. Um, and I'm not worried about changing the shape, the, the plateauiness of it. I just want to make it go higher. Uh, a lattice with no, or well, with, with two columns and two rows, the bare minimum, works for that. I believe there's also another tool, um, the region keys tool, uh, works exactly like this. Okay. Um, which makes me think that there is absolutely no point to the region keys tool because it's exactly the same as a lattice with the minimum rows and columns. Uh, so this would be a case where I, uh, you know, I would refer to the region keys tool the same way that Kenny referred to breakdowns and lattices in saying that I don't get it, I just don't think there's a point, and so I never use it. Okay, um, you could, I suppose, if that's what you wanted to do, but um, just use the same tool that you're using for other things. It, it works just as well. In fact, it's even more powerful because if you really wanted to, you could, you know, do something like that. Okay. Um, all right. So I'll I'll go back now. I, I've I've said my piece. I'll go back to the original edit. Now uh, there's another interesting use for this lattice deformer. Let's say you get some mocap like this that doesn't quite loop properly. Let's say that the values are exactly the same. Okay. I'm going to copy this value over to here. Okay. But look how this is, you can tell this is supposed to be a wave like this, right? You can tell when this cycles that there's going to be a hitch right here. Let's make it even more extreme because 
that that doesn't illustrate the point quite well enough. But say you get the mocap and it looks like this already, something like that. Okay, you've got this huge hit. You know what you want it to do. Um, you want it to to have this kind of smooth motion up into here. Well, you can also do this with a lattice deformer that actually has two and two. Uh, sorry, select one less. Grab this one and just drag it down until it feels good. Okay. Uh, if you find that now I've messed up my valley back here that I came from, you may need to add more columns. Okay. And now it has more of a proper momentum coming up and into there. Okay, so if you're editing the time of your animation, it's no problem to select your entire character here and edit all of the channels together. Okay, when you're dragging left and right, um, an ease out is an ease out is an ease out. It, it, it all works the same. But if you're, if you're doing any reshaping of the values, in other words, if you want to move things vertically, then watch out, okay? I could maybe do just the green and blue together because they have the same shape. Um, moving this would be moving it. Um, let me zoom in here. Moving this up is moving this part closer to where it's coming from, okay? It's creating more of an ease out. However, if I've got my red selected too, then moving this bar up is actually bringing these values away from the key that they're coming from and therefore causing a fast out. So now what's in, what's a slow out down here is a fast out up here from the same edit and I'm breaking things, okay? So let's, let's review this a bit. Um, the pros of using the Lattice Deformer, you can add eases in and out of your edits for more seamless results, okay? Um, you don't get those hard linear corners, change in direction. It can be used both to edit timing as well as value. However, um, keep in mind, you know, if, if you're editing value, that you keep it to just one channel or channels that are doing the exact same thing in parallel. Okay. Uh, the downsides of using the last deformer is just that, uh, that, that value edits need to be done per curve, and so that can be very time consuming. And we're in the business of trying to speed up your workflow, not slow it down. So if, if you have to do that to more than one uh, F curve, um, use a different method, okay? If, if, for example, I mean, it's not that rare of a case. Uh, you may have just the translate Y on the, the main center of gravity mover, cog, um, or body controller, whatever they call it in your rig. Um, and you may just be doing that one axis. Go in there, go crazy. You can edit the values, um, especially if it's dense data, if it's late in your shot and you get a note to change it, uh, or if you have mocap and you need to change it. You don't have to go back setting a whole ton of keys. You can, you can take what's there and reshape it, okay? Um, Another con is that uh, obviously if you're adjusting the timing, you're going to wind up with some non-integer frames, but we've already kind of covered how to, uh, how to deal with those. You can either live with it. Uh, you can set new keys on the frames and delete the non-integer keys, or you can snap those integer keys. And um, hopefully, I, I usually try that first and I look at the results. Uh, hopefully they're okay. Sometimes they're perfectly fine and I don't have to worry about it. Sometimes they've moved too far and I can tell that it's off and, uh, and then I need to go in and clean it up. But it's usually only a couple spots I need to clean up. I don't have to clean up every, every single one. And another downside of the Lattice Deformer is that it can feel a bit clumsy sometimes. You probably saw me uh, accidentally deselecting things and then when you select it again, the Lattice Deformer doesn't have the shape that it had when you left off editing it. Um, it doesn't matter that much, really, but uh, it's a little annoying. It feels kind of clumsy, but, um, but it certainly has its uses, okay? All right, so we covered uh, 
break down keys in Maya and lattice deformers in the graph editor. These are not the only tools you're going to use, of course, for retiming or reshaping your F curves. But I hope that you know maybe you could experiment and try them. Uh, the perfect place to try them would be in the Anim Gym. It's a quick test. Uh, try it out. If it slows you down and you don't like it, um, then I'm totally wrong and you don't have to ever do it again. But if you find that there is a use for it, um, then great. I've just added one little tiny tool to your toolbox, uh, which I'm sure is full with many tools, and Kenny is adding more to it all the time. So that's the, that's the whole thing, right? You need to keep analyzing your workflow, keep looking for new ways to do things, and keep discarding the things that don't work, and, uh, and don't settle for something that feels too tedious. You know, there, there's probably a better way to do what you're struggling with. Um, so don't be afraid to, to try new things, okay? Thank you for supporting the website, and uh, you're obviously doing the right thing by being proactive with your workflow, otherwise you wouldn't be here. So just keep going, and uh, take care. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.